because Telegraph Creek up north, when they're evacuated and everything's closed down, you may be bartering cookies, <laughs> right, for a bottle of water. I don't, I don't know. But come prepared. You know. Yeah, please. Yeah, just further to that, um, just an example uh, from, what was that, 2018? Uh, Chad and I got deployed up to a place called Bad Nuni Lake. We were there on the uh, Fraser Complex. And uh, Peter was there too. Um, we had been fighting fire like in, in kind of rural, intermixed type environment. Um, we finished that mission, went back to camp, got reassigned to a place called Batanuni Lake that none of us had ever heard of. So it turns out that this place is like a little ranch community, like there was like eight structures, eight farms kind of thing. Um, what was the big surprise was that it was 125 kilometers down a logging road into the middle of nowhere. Um, Vancouver Engine 7 was in the lead, Type 1 engine, so it was interesting right off the bat, broke down halfway. Replace the air filter, we're good to go. So again, just having that stuff on board before you deploy, like you have to be ready to hit the ground. Like the minute you arrive in camp, you go through staging accountability, you could be gone. And you have to have that absolutely. We get to Baton Rouge Lake, um, started operations there, realized we had enough fuel for about three hours of operations at site, not enough fuel to actually leave, that is to escape to any sort of safety zone or to leave the area. So again, you know, as an engine boss, make sure your crew's ready because your task force leader is going to be busy worrying about how the hell we get fuel delivered 120 kilometers into nowhere so we can actually get out of here alive. Yeah. So just being ready like that is crucial. Um, expect like zero comms with family. So it's important, like the chief said, make sure everybody knows where you are because there's, you know, yeah, we had sat phones, but zero for two worked for whatever reason. Sat phones don't work sometimes. So just being absolutely ready for that is critical. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things that happened in Bat Nuni when we arrived, uh, when, when uh, Watson arrived there was, and this is where I really want to focus on, we talk about 48 hours self-sufficient. When you see 48 hours self-sufficient out there and everyone has that, I'll be like, I'll be high-fiving everybody because everyone shows up with, if you think about the apparatus you're going to take right now, say it's a type 1 engine, where are you putting all of that equipment? Where are you putting 48 hours worth of food for four people? Where are you putting tents for four people? Where are you putting sleeping bags for four people? It's gonna take your whole four inch bed. So doing that pre-planning now before you get the tap to understand, hey, I've got four bins that are in the hall. They're ready to go. When I go into you know the, the local outdoor shop and I'm looking for boil in a bag foods, I'm looking, like I can diet when I get back to town, I'm looking for the highest calorie count on whatever I can get to pour water into. Don't care what the taste is. Um, and I'm doing more than 48 hours worth of food. But when, when Watson got to Bat Nooney, they started breaking into cabins for places to sleep for the night. And we might not have that luxury when we get out there um, 120 miles into nowhere. So make sure that your departments are understanding when we say 48 hours, like get that stuff going now. It's a good time of year uh, to head down to your local uh, outdoor shop and start stacking that stuff up. Make sure you have cooking equipment. Make, you know, all of that stuff is super important. And I haven't, including myself, so I've learned the hard way as well, is like I've gone out there thinking, oh yeah, no, I'm gonna have a hotel, I'm gonna have a restaurant, I'm gonna have a camp. And, and it's like, oh wow, okay, well, gonna survive on the water that I have with me for the next 48 hours. So I didn't really plan that well. So make sure that that's what you take back out of this course is that your departments are actually getting prepared uh, for 48 hours of self-sufficient. Thanks guys. Yep. Yeah. We should be wiping that down between. I, uh, I find as structural firefighters, we, oh, sorry. I find as structural firefighters, when you hear or you're dispatched or deployed to an incident, the rush is to get out the door, get there first, figure it out later. Um, would you guys say that there's, there should be more emphasis on you know, being prepared when you leave, getting the equipment in the truck, yeah. knowing exactly what you have before you get out the door kind of thing? Let me just, <laughs> I'm just going to use one. Uh, yeah, typically, so if you're being deployed out for the province, is we're into some type of extended attack, right? We're not in that initial attack phase. So you're going to be a resource coming into the incident for a future operational period. So whether you arrive eight hours after you get your drawdown or 10 hours after you get your drawdown, if you come eight hours unprepared or 10 hours prepared, you're a lot better off down the line 
um, being set up and doing that pre-work now should speed up your uh, when you respond out from your community, but definitely being prepared before you leave is going to pay pay off in spades down the road. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm I'm the one that actually deployed these two to Batanuni Lake, and I can tell you it wasn't that bad because eventually they got into a fishing lodge where they had meals provided to them, soft, cozy beds. So yeah, it, it sounds tough, but they actually got into it. It was hell. Situation. It was hell. <laughs> Roast beef every night, yeah, anyways. On yeah, on Thursdays, yeah. Um, okay, so incident assignment, uh, know where you're going, know what you're getting yourself into, lots of discussion around that. Know where your incident check-in location is, what the fire name is, what the incident name is. Um, if you have an EMBC task number, that should be on your drawdown. The fire resource number should be on your drawdown. What communications you are going to be coming in on. So if you're coming in onto an event, especially under incident uh, initial attack, uh, we should be communicating on a generalized program, that is OFC1. Everybody on deployment should have OFC1 and OFC2. And if you know the repeater systems for BC Wildfire Service, which nobody can ever understand, I would probably try to program that into your radios also. But that's a whole nother note. Find a red shirt and uh, figure it out with them. Um, who are you reporting to? What is your travel time? Uh, bring maps. You know what? If you know the location that you're going to, bring some print. If you have a GIS team in your municipality, have them print out some nice 25, 23 by or 24 by 23, 32 maps, a color, so you can roll them out in your tailboard, and then you're not relying on the incident to provide you with maps. There's a check out of Venza maps on your uh, applications through um, whatever device you're using. Download that. It's free. You can have three maps on that. I can tell you right now. It is a lifesaver. It'll give you geo-reference locations of where you are in that lo location. There's free maps you can download online uh, that you kind of show you where you are to, in the topography in the area that you're working in. And it is a lifesaver, especially if you're coming into a place like Van Jam. Where the heck is Van Jam? Well, it's a fire center in, in uh, Vanderhoof. I didn't know that. I didn't even, I tried Googling Van Jam and there was no place like that in the province of BC. So I just headed north and eventually found it. But. Yeah, please do. Um, so from our perspective, and we're going to, you know, touch this again in, in, uh, in safety, but this one specifically, I took this picture from the back parking lot of uh, Station 31 in West Kelowna uh, when Joe Rich was hosting an event. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, in the first operational period, uh, we were dropped off the uh, call list. So we watched Summerland and Penticton and Beachland and everybody come up to this event. And, and uh, we were all dressed ready, but we just sat there and, and watched it. But uh, it's really important that at, as, as the engine boss uh, on that truck is that you're the boss. It's okay to be the boss. So um, part of the safety piece of that is that when we have PPE requirements on scene and whatnot and, and there's safety protocols in place when you arrive on scene, it's your responsibility as that engine boss to make sure that everybody is following the, the requirements of that job. So your strike team task force leader is gonna tell you the required level of PPE. It's your responsibility to make sure that your crews are wearing it. So for me on this fire, I'm going out and I'm finding you know, engines that are not wearing PPE and they're riding in the back of pickup trucks, leaving their engines at the head of the fire. And I'm going, what is going on here? But so then as a strike team task force leader, that's my job to, to reset that, right? So also being the boss. So as an engine boss, the, the responsibility is on you to ensure that crew safety and making sure that you're following what comes out in the IAP and what your strike team task force leader is, is giving you. And if you're not getting that information, start asking for it from your strike team task force leader. They should have those answers. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're going to get into, I know the slide's hard to see, but it's in your book. Um, it's about where we fit within the organizational chart of the incident command system. Um, and, it, and it's a bit of a pliable, and we'll talk a bit more on this when um, Kim, our IC, comes up to explain the, the organizational structure. But the structure protection branch falls under operations. And there's two, there's two groups within that branch. It's structure protection, which is the SPS, sprinkler systems, uh, st structure protection uh, units and crews, uh, tenders, single resources. And then there's the structure defense group, which is you folks, the engines, the tenders, wildland units. 
And typically, they report to either a, a group supervisor or a div, div supervisor into a branch, and then the branch reports up into the ops. Uh, basically, that's how it's played out. Um, in a lot of ways, there is a, there's a tight synergy between the Office of the Fire Commissioner, Command Staff, the Structure Protection Group. Uh, you'll see these guys in the blue uniforms, like Brent and Chad, maybe holding group suit positions or div suit positions or task force leader positions. And you'll find guys like myself in the red shirts working more frequently in the structure protection side of things, being sprinklers. But there, there's a, like I said, it's a synergy and efforts on both levels being uh, one can fill either position uh, within that, that branch structure. Uh, again, a really difficult slide to say, and I apologize for this, but you can see, so this here is the, uh, this is the Fraser Lake Complex Incident Command uh, high-level structure, and this, uh, this itself here is the structure protection branch. So the branch of the structure protection can be quite large. So the, the system has to be very, uh, understand incident command systems very well and know exactly how we fit within the organizational structure. Okay. A uh, quick shot on, um, this was the first operational period on the uh, for, uh, Christie Mountain complex, uh, for fire last summer. Uh, the apparatus uh, all coming in, a T card system for accountability. This is, uh, I know it seems uh, rudimentary, but it's a very strong system. It does not rely on electronics. It is uh, it's a familiar system for those branch and group supervisors uh, to be able to, uh, to, to be mobile, to be accountable, for us to inform our task force leaders on what resources they have, and they can build their own T-card system out. We'll get more into that. But yeah, this is, this is the staging base, right? So this is our resources on scene. And you can see here that everything is accountable uh, as per the staging manager's demands and requests, and we'll get further into that here shortly. What are the differences between a strike team and a task force? You should know this as an engine boss. You may be assigned to a strike team. What is a strike team? Is five of similar types of apparatus uh, with, common, with a one leader and common communications. Uh, so it could be type five apparatus, it could be type six apparatus, it could be type one large engines. Uh, ultimately, the dream team would be a strike team of uh, type three wildland units, but that's very hard to get on these types of deployments. Uh, but a task force, uh, typically a mixture of all those types of pieces of apparatus and five to seven per unit, but I've seen task forces as large as 12 units uh, under one common leader with common communications. So you may be under a major task force that's on a swing shift or, or whatever it may be doing structure protection. You'll work under one task force leader for that, for that particular unit. Knowing ICS and your responsibilities, um, although you may be working as an engine boss, you may hold other responsibilities within that task force. Uh, we, we, like, the, like Chad and Brent going out to Baton Uni, that's a long run to go to, and you better make sure you got everything covered off. So you may have a logistics section, you may have a planning section, an ops section for fuel. Like, however the task force leader chooses to give assignments to each person, you as an engine boss, you may be given other responsibilities, so be aware of that. You may be assigned a second IC for that, for that crew, right? If the task force leader needs to take off to a meeting, to meet the div, the vision supervisor, you may become second IC for that task force. And you may end up be giving briefings for, for mentoring opportunities. So be aware of that. That leadership is imperative in these roles. Yeah, the, absolutely, Chief. And uh, one thing that we typically do on deployment is that we'll make our two IC also our scout. Yeah. So think about what kind of apparatus you like out in front, uh, going back to Pat Nooney, logging roads or low visibility in the roads, whatever. You want something that's pretty agile and light, so like a type five, type six uh, type of engine as your two IC out and scout. And then in terms of the other ICS functional uh, positions, uh, like the chief said, like you, and it, you could have a type one engine that deals with all the ops issues for your task force, okay? Ditto for planning, so like getting maps from the planning section, logistics, figuring out where we fuel up, all that stuff. So expect that uh, being assigned to you, one of those functions. Yeah. 